Next is about the discussion of congenital heart defects in children. I'll start with asynotic congenital heart defects, which are more common compared to synotic congenital heart defects. Among the asynotic heart defects, the overall most common type is ventricular septal defect. Among the different types of ventricular septal defect, the most common subtype of ventricular septal defect is perimembranous VSD. Perimembranous type is the overall most common type of VSD or ventricular septal defect. Talking about the characteristic feature of this particular condition, it is pan-systolic murmur. which is characteristically noted in the left fourth ICS that is intercostal space near to the sternal area or parasternal region. This is the location of the pansystolic murmur which is very characteristic of VSD. The other types of asynotic heart defects include the other examples of left to right shunts which includes atrial septal defect. Atrial septal defect is again divided into two varieties, namely ostium primum ASD and ostium secundum ASD, out of which ostium secundum ASD is the common type of ASD. The characteristic feature of atrial septal defect on examination of the patient is wide fixed splitting of second heart sound. Those are the salient features of ASD or atrial septal defect. Next left to right shunt is PDA which is patent ductus arteriosus. As such there are no types of PDA. Only point to be noted is PDA is more common in preterm babies and PDA is also more common in congenital rubella syndrome. And the characteristic feature of patent ductus arteriosus on clinical examination is a loud or machinery continuous murmur which is heard in the left second intercostal space near to the sternal region. These are the characteristic features of PDA. Now talking about the complications of left to right shunt, they can be divided into early complications as well as late complications. The early complication occurs in the first few months or years uh, of life which includes number one recurrent infection and the two recurrent respiratory infections. This is because left to right shunt is associated with pulmonary congestion that leads to recurrent respiratory infections. Next is a complication of CCF or congestive cardiac failure due to congestion inside the heart and third is infection which is infective endocarditis. And please note for your exams that the most common organism associated with infective endocarditis in children is streptococcus viridans. These are the early complications. Late complication occurs few or many years later and it includes shunt reversal wherein the left to right shunt changes to right to left shunt. This is associated with irreversible changes in the pulmonary vasculature as well as associated right ventricular hypertrophy and the name of the shunt reversal is called as Eisenmenger's syndrome. Eisenmenger's syndrome, because the shunt is getting reversed, the patient develops cyanosis as well as clubbing. The next asynotic heart defect is coarctation of aorta which refers to narrowing of the aorta. The most common site of coarctation is juxtaductal which means near to the area of ductus arteriosus. It is usually located uh, near the junction of the arch of the aorta and the descending aorta. The characteristic features of coarctation includes because of the narrowing there is a decreased blood flow to the lower limbs resulting in the claudication pain in the lower limbs there is also feeble femoral pulses and third important feature is there is hypertension noted in the upper limbs these are the characteristic clinical examination findings 
in case of coarctation of aorta and the characteristic x-ray finding is notching of the ribs by the enlarged intercostal arteries noted in this condition and it is characteristically inferior rib notching inferior rib notching there is also another characteristic sign noted in the x-ray which is caused by pre and post aortic dilatation around the coarctation of aorta and that creates the characteristic three sign on the chest x-ray which is related to pre and post aortic dilatation of the segments of the aorta so that is about the characteristic features of coarctation of aorta moving on to the next one that is cyanotic congenital heart disease the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease in children is TOF which is tetralogy of fallow an important point to be noted is tetralogy of fallow presents with cyanosis but the cyanosis usually starts after six weeks after birth more than six weeks after birth so that is why if the question is asking about what is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease to present in the neonatal period then your answer is slightly going to be different it is TGA which is transposition of the great arteries now talking about the most common overall cyanotic congenital heart disease which is tetralogy of fallow there are four components as expected one is the overriding of iota number two is right ventricular hypertrophy number three is the subpulmonary stenosis which is basically due to infundibular hypertrophy and this subpulmonary stenosis is also called as RVOT obstruction what is the meaning of RVOT it is right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and fourth important feature is ventricular septal defect the characteristic findings noted in tetralogy of fallow is number one cyanosis and number two is the presence of ejection systolic murmur which is related to subpulmonary stenosis these are the characteristic findings of tetralogy of fallow now there is an important complication of tetralogy of fallow called as the cyanotic spell which is characterized by worsening of cyanosis in a child with tetralogy of fallow and this is usually precipitated by exertion there are some important aspects in the management of cyanotic spell that one should know about these include oxygen administration administration of sodium bicarbonate to counteract the acidosis which is encountered in cyanotic spells number three is morphine this is to depress the respiratory center of the brain thereby decreasing the severity of hyperventilation usually noted in tetralogy of fallow number four is beta blockers which will help to decrease the infundibular spasm remember infundibular spasm is one of the early events occurring in a cyanotic spell and tackling that is of great importance for which beta blockers is helpful number five alpha agonist which help in the vasoconstriction or increasing the systemic vascular resistance also decrease the severity of cyanotic spell number six when we see a child with a cyanotic spell the usual posture adapted is a squatting which helps to increase the systemic vascular resistance at the level of the femoral arteries however in a small child squatting is not possible so we ask the mother to put the child in the knee chest position in this position the thigh gets compressed and the femoral vessels get compressed similar to that of a squatting so knee chest position is considered as a squatting equivalent these are the usual management option available for a child with cyanotic spell the management option of a child with tetralogy of fallow includes definitive surgery or shunt surgery the aim of the shunt surgery is to improve the pulmonary blood flow So basically there is a connection to the pulmonary artery to improve its blood flow 
and that connection could be in the form of subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery which is called as the BT shunt or the Blalock toxic shunt. When this BT shunt is done with the help of a um, synthetic material like Gore-Tex, it is called as the modified BT shunt which is again a connection between subclavian artery and the pulmonary artery. However, it is done with this material called Gore-Tex. Okay, this is called as a modified BT shunt and this is important to be remembered because the most common shunt surgery is modified BT shunt surgery. The next shunt surgery is by connecting ascending iota to the pulmonary artery. This name of the shunt surgery is called water stent shunt. Next is connecting the descending iota to the pulmonary artery and it is called as the pot shunt. These are the different names of the shunt surgeries associated with tetralogy of halo treatment. But please don't forget the most common overall shunt surgery is the modified BT shunt. Now coming to characteristic X-ray appearances noted in case of different congenital heart defects. One is a boot shaped heart which is called as a choir and sebow. It is a characteristic finding of tetralogy of halo. And the reason for this is right ventricular hypertrophy. Next is a condition called egg on a side appearance or egg on a string appearance which is very classically noted with transposition of the great arteries. The reason is because of the arrangement of the arteries in a narrow fashion above the level of the heart noted in transposition of great arteries. Third important is a box shaped heart which is noted in a condition called Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly is a condition characterized by downward displacement of the tricuspid valve and because of that there is an increased size of the right atrium or there is right atrial enlargement and that is the reason for box shaped heart noted on an x-ray. Fourth one is the figure of 8 appearance or the snowman appearance which is noted in condition of TAPVC which is total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. It is usually noted in one subtype called supracardiac TAPVC. In supracardiac TAPVC, the veins, the pulmonary veins go above the level of the heart, join the SVC and they drain into right atrium and because of which the size of the superior vena cava increases and this gives rise to the figure of 8 or the snowman appearance. So the reason for figure of 8 is dilated SVC or superior vena cava noted in this condition. So that is about the different appearances on the x-ray in case of congenital heart defects. Moving on to the next is an acquired condition called acute rheumatic fever which is usually a post streptococcal condition usually following a streptococcal pharyngitis. And this condition usually occurs in school going children after the age of 5 years. The usual sequence is like initially pharyngitis occurs and following few weeks say like 1 to 3 weeks later this ARF or acute rheumatic fever occurs. So what is the basic pathogenesis of this particular condition? Now following a streptococcal infection there is development of antibodies and these antibodies attack the structures which look like streptococcal antigen or streptococcal antigen themselves. Some of the body's own tissue have this appearance of a streptococcal antigen so these antibodies start attacking them. So this process is what we call it as molecular mimicry. That is a basic pathogenesis of acute rheumatic fever. Now talking about the features and the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever, it is based on modified Jones criteria where the criteria is slightly modified according to low risk or high risk population. India comes under the category of high risk population basically because the number of cases of rheumatic fever as well as rheumatic heart disease is more. So that is why in India, the Jones criteria which is applicable is for the category of moderate to high risk population. You have major criteria as well as minor criteria. 
and there are some modification which you should be knowing about the first thing is about the carditis we all know that the classical carditis in acute rheumatic fever is pancarditis that is all layers of the heart is affected previously pancarditis is only a clinical criteria means if you find any evidence of cardiac involvement clinically like for example new murmur change in the heart rate then it is considered as a carditis or pancarditis now it is not only clinical it is and or subclinical that's an important point and because of this 90% of the patients are found to have some evidence of carditis making carditis as the most common feature of acute rheumatic fever next major criteria is the joints previously we used to consider only polyarthritis as a criteria but now it is polyarthritis or monoarthritis or polyarthralgia any one is considered as a major criteria next is regarding chorea which is called as a sindenham's chorea characterized by extra pyramidal movements that is chorea and sindenham's chorea if it occurs it is usually the last finding in a rheumatic fever case next is about erythema marginatum which is again a major criteria and as the name implies it is characterized by redness more in the margins and you have subcutaneous nodules usually in the skin around the joint areas especially the extensor aspect of the elbows is where they are commonly noted all these five are the major criteria minor criteria remember previously polyarthralgia was a minor criteria but now polyarthralgia is a major criteria so now the minor criteria is monoarthralgia next is about fever remember this degree more than 38 degree centigrade previously the fever cut off was taken as a temperature more than 38.5 degree centigrade but now it is just more than 38 degree centigrade itself that's a change which i wanted you to remember about the next criteria is esr more than 30 mm per hour in the first hour see it should be more than 30 mm per hour this is applicable for indian population because previously the cut off we used were more than 60 mm per hour now it is revised to more than 30 mm per hour and or crp which is c reactive protein more than or equal to 3 mg per deciliter the final minor criteria is the prolonged pr interval on an ecg these are the major and minor criteria of acute rheumatic fever in order to make a diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever you should have two major criteria or one major plus two minor criteria or in case of recurrences of rheumatic fever even three minor criteria can be accepted but it should not be forgotten that if any of the major minor criteria are present in addition you should always have the essential criteria essential criteria is usually an evidence of preceding streptococcal infection which is by increase in the levels of aso titer ASO stands for anti streptolysin O this is the diagnostic criteria of acute rheumatic fever and as far as the treatment is concerned uh, these patients they require treatment with steroids which is the preferred anti inflammatory agents you can also use aspirin but the preferred agent is always always steroids and the usual duration of treatment is 12 weeks along with that to eradicate the streptococci you give a course of penicillin for 10 days these are the usual drugs used in the management of acute rheumatic fever acute rheumatic fever is a condition which can recur again and if it recurs the attack on the heart or the heart damage is going to be severe that is why for all patient with rheumatic fever you need to give prophylaxis what is called as secondary prophylaxis the usual drug for prophylaxis is the penicillin nowadays oral penicillin v is what is used if the patient is allergic to penicillin you can use a macrolide like erythromycin the duration of penicillin prophylaxis is also important and it depends upon the condition of the patient if the patient did not have carditis in the initial episode the duration of prophylaxis is for next 5 years or till the patient attains the age of 18 years whichever is longer 
Suppose the patient has carditis, the duration of prophylaxis is for the next 10 years or till the age of 25 years, whichever is longer again. Suppose the patient has an established rheumatic heart disease or underwent a surgery like a valve replacement or repair, it is ideally lifelong prophylaxis. These are the usual duration of prophylaxis in a case of acute rheumatic fever. Talking about another condition which is a very important vasculitic disorder of medium vessel vasculitis is Kawasaki disease which has now become the most common childhood vasculitis in India. An important point about Kawasaki disease is that there is an increased risk of coronary involvement and it can cause complications like myocarditis, myocardial ischemia as well as coronary artery aneurysms. So increased risk of coronary complication is the most troublesome problem about Kawasaki disease. So that is why Kawasaki disease requires an earlier identification and treatment. The early identification of Kawasaki disease is with the help of certain characteristic features. The most important feature is fever for at least 5 days. Along with fever, there should be some other associated findings which are remembered like this as a mnemonic C for conjunctivitis, R for rash which is a non-specific rash and E for involvement of extremities where you usually have edema in the limbs. A for lymph adenopathy. A for adenopathy, it is usually unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy and M for the mucosal changes which is characterized by redness in the lip, tongue as well as in the buccal mucosa and the reddish tongue noted in this condition is characteristically called as strawberry tongue. So you can see that I have said fever along with that in the other criteria, five criteria I have told you. To make a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease, fever should be present along with that four out of five criteria in the others should be present. Okay, then you make a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease and once you make a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease, please remember you have to start treatment. And the best drug for treatment of Kawasaki disease is IVIG. Intravenous immunoglobulin treatment if started early in the uh, course of Kawasaki disease greatly decreases the incidence of coronary artery aneurysms and that is how it is very helpful in the management of Kawasaki disease. <laughs>